presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts in this Advent season with your love and your care for us. And I ask especially this night for the intercession of the Venerable Mary of the to go before your throne in heaven and ask for help that I may give the story with incredible grace and truth. And I ask for the intercession of our Blessed Mother to guide and protect this entire parish family. And I ask for the intercession of St. Joseph, a faithful leader of the Holy Family, to lead us all closer to our Lord in this Advent season. And so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, my Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, the story of the Nativity. So, what we're going to do here in the beginning is, is I'm going to um, talk about Venerable Mary of Great because I assume that most of you don't know much about her because I didn't know much about her. And she was born um, the 2nd of April in 1602 in a great Spain. And in 1617, she entered the convent of the Immaculate Conception in a greater and took her vows in 1618 as a poor Clare nun under the rule or after the rule of St. Francis. And I just thought it was kind of neat when I was reading that that in those days throughout most of Europe, um, there was a convent or a monastery in almost every, every village. So what a great blessing that was in that time. In 1625, she was chosen as the abbess of her convent, and it was much against her wishes. Except for a few short years, she was re-elected to that position every three years until her death in 1665. She is most revered for her exalted virtues, that her life closely reflected that of St. Francis. And the miracle of biolocation related to her is in fact more remarkable and lasted longer than that recorded of any other saint. Now if you don't know what biolocation is, it's a miracle gift given by God that allows certain saints to be in two places at one time. And you're going to think about that and thank you. Even in the last century, um, St. Padre Pio had that ability. And you can research this and find it out for yourself. Um, she bilocated more than 500 times to the American Southwest from her convent in Spain. And this is documented and it can be researched. In fact, there's a YouTube video about it. If you go on YouTube and you search the Venerable Mary of Agreda, the real flying nun, it'll come up with about a 13 minute video that will talk about how that happened. I don't have time to tell all, I have told people about it, but it's a, it's a short video and it'll, it'll do very well. So she wrote um, this history for the first time from 1637 until 1645. And as soon as the insistence of her superiors and the poor judgment of an outside confessor relaxed, she burned the work. Can you imagine almost 10 years of work and she burned it? And later in this work that I'm reading now, she stated that she thought that was probably an act of God because it's so much better and she did a lot better job the second time. But um, as soon as uh, uh, she succeeded in delaying the rewriting of it for more than 10 years, but at that same time, the visions continued, and only under the strictest command of her superiors did she again start to rewrite the history in 1655, and she finished the work in 1665, shortly before her death. Um, the original manuscript of her writings is still intact and preserved 
in the monastery in Greater Spain, where she lies, and her body is incorrupt. And again, if you don't know anything about the incorrupt bodies of saints, I urge you to do that, because these are such great gifts of our Holy Mother Church to enhance our faith and see the, the greatness of these men and women and what they did in their lives. This, this is what the work looks like. It's four volumes, and it's more than 2,200 pages. And it took more than 10 years, of course, for it to write. And so what's amazing about all this is, is that I don't like to read. And yet, God's allowed me to tear into this. And I started reading in, in uh, March, and uh, it's just exploded. I can't really wait to tell people about it. But in any case, um, let's begin then with the mystical city of God. That's what it's called. And the mystical city of God describes the Blessed Mother and her role in all of created history. She's the new Jerusalem, the new tabernacle, the new Ark of the Covenant, the house of the Creator Himself. And our Blessed Mother is the greatest creation of the Most High God. Everything up until that time was no equal to the creation of our Blessed Mother. She was His greatest work. Our Blessed Mother being perfectly created without the stain of original sin. So when the time had arrived for the coming of the Word made flesh, the angel Gabriel was called before the throne of God, the Most High, and he knelt down and humbly received the message of the Father to take to the Virgin Mary. The Holy Spirit was with him, and a myriad of angels accompanied him to see the Virgin. Can you just imagine, you know, Gabriel leaving heaven and this myriad of angels going with him? Because this is an incredibly important task. The detail of this history is so complete and finite that if I was to tell you the same section that I'm going to share with you tonight in the details, it would take almost four hours. But I've trimmed it and I'm going to tell, you know, the important things, the things that are, you know, necessary for the story. And so, it was a Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Okay, here's your details. And our Blessed Mother was in her chamber praying. The Holy Archangel Gabriel appeared and saluted our Queen. And she was quite taken by his greeting. Blessed are you among women. For she thought of herself as no one special and humble before God. We know from the Gospel of St. Luke all that corresponded in this exchange. She knew that her answer would have great consequences for the world and for mankind and for all of eternity. In the instant of her consent, let it be done to me as you say, the Holy Spirit came upon her and in that instant, she saw everything that was to be. And she saw in her great love for the will of God, the redemption of mankind, and it overwhelmed her immaculate heart. And in that instant, her heart contracted with such great force that three drops of blood were expelled, and the Holy Spirit took those drops of blood to her womb, and the Word was made flesh. Isn't that an incredible picture? of how that happened, the incarnation of our God and our Lord. So you see, from the very beginning, the heart of our mother was at play in our redemption. Our blessed mother, in her deep love for God, was swept up into the beatific vision with God at this moment. It just amazes me every time I read that. It just fills you with your heart. In this exchange, the Archangel Gabriel tells Mary of her cousin Elizabeth, already in her sixth month. 
for she who was thought to be sterile. But Mary receives this message in another way in prayer from her son and from the father that she is to go in haste to see Elizabeth and Zachariah. Now in order to do this, she needed the permission of her holy spouse, St. Joseph. And I just want to say something about that. The humbleness of our Blessed Mother is just incredible when I read this. She has so many gifts and powers that God has given her, and yet her humility allows her deep respect for the head of her household, for her spouse Joseph, for the holy priesthood, for the things that God has put in place. So she confronts Joseph, and Joseph gladly agrees. And together they put together provisions, and they leave the next day. Now the journey takes four days, and it's about 100 miles, so it's definitely in haste. So they make about, four, about 25 miles a day on foot. You know, and that's moving right along. And some of the country is very rough along the way. And it's not a journey for a maiden. But our Blessed Mother is young. And she's full of life. And something beautiful happens in this journey together. In the holy and intriguing conversation about their faith. And in seeing the divine presence in each other. They grow very close in these four days. It was a mystery, a burning bond between them, and they enjoyed each other's company more and more as they went along. Many other things happened in this journey. This is part of those details that I don't have time to go into. But suffice to say that our Blessed Mother, already having the Creator within her, had a keen sense of noticing those along the way that were disturbed hurt and downtrodden, and she, through the power of our Lord, passed many miracles to these people along the way, and it says in there that their lives changed forever, and they never went back to the way they were. Upon arrival in the house, St. Joseph went ahead and announced their coming. But at the greeting of Mary to Elizabeth, the baby, baby leapt for joy in her womb. And in that moment, our Creator, the Lord, through the voice of the Blessed Mother, freed John the Baptist of his original sin and filled him with abundant graces of the Holy Spirit that lasted his entire life. Being the precursor to the Word made flesh, it was the will of the Father that the first thing to be done was that He be free with all of His faculties to proclaim the coming. And this was the real reason for the trip in haste to see Elizabeth and the child. And I always saw that different, you know. I saw that the Blessed Mother went in haste in a charitable way to help her what I thought was a, an older cousin, you know, in a midwife fashion. And that's also true, but the real reason was to build John up for his mission. So Joseph returned to Nazareth, and Mary stayed for three months till the birth of John. And after the birth and the circumcision of John, and Zachariah had regained his ability to speak, Joseph was sent for to return and help Mary back to Nazareth. When Joseph arrives, he's met with great joy, and now everyone knows of the child Jesus, except for Joseph. And I always think, you know, about Joseph, he's in this, in the, he's the patriarch of this family, and Jesus knows what's going on, and Mary knows what's going on, Joseph has to trust. So if you ever have issues with trust, St. Joseph is the saint to pray to. The return trip is also a 
great gift and a blessing to the holy couple. By God's will, they are drawn closer and closer in this pilgrimage together. Back in Nazareth, things change for Mary. She looks within to the Lord for strength and help in all things. And I will just say this, that Mary had very much anxiety over the timing of when Joseph would know of the pregnancy. She also battled greatly at this time with Lucifer and his minions. Don't ever think that our Blessed Mother doesn't know what you're going through in this battlefield. She knows. In the fifth month, Joseph noticed the Blessed Mother was with child. And you might think, wow, oh, the fifth month, but the clothing they wore in those days and our Blessed Mother being perfect young woman. It took that long. But from that moment, his soul was tormented. He knew the heart of Mary from their time together, and he knew that she could not be with another man. But his soul gave him no other explanation. And Mary knew that he knew. And his anxiety and torment grew day by day. He became more distant over time, and the Blessed Mother became more worried about him. He was not eating and not sleeping properly. She prayed for him without end, asking the angels to obtain a remedy from the Most High. She trusted God the Father to provide the solution for this dilemma in her life. Always trust Mary. She knows firsthand the power of intercessory prayer. We have so many people in our lives to pray for. And she knows. And you know, in my life earlier, I always thought of the, you know, the Holy Family having all these special privileges, and yet God even allowed them to have these challenges and crosses in their life. Because it's in these challenging times that God allows His grace to do incredible things in our lives. Joseph could take no more. In all of his prayer, he had found no satisfying answer. So he made a plan to leave. He had gathered some debts that were owed him and put a small traveling pack together. He had planned to leave in the night. And he fell asleep in prayer. The Archangel Gabriel came to him in his sleep, revealing the truth of the child Jesus and all that had taken place to that point. Now knowing the whole story, Joseph awoke, and tears of joy filled his eyes and his heart in thanksgiving. He immediately asked God for his forgiveness for his lack of trust and knowledge. Since our mother Mary was not lit up, Joseph, so happy, begins to clean the house. And you men thought that he thought of that the first time. When Mary does arise, Joseph falls to his knees and begs forgiveness from the queen. And she begs him to stand, not to kneel before her, although proper for her son, not for her. And Joseph resolves right then and there to devote his life, the rest of his life, to the care and protection of the Blessed Mother and the Creator. And from that time on, they shared an even more intense care and love for one another. In the months that followed, they worked in great harmony together. Joseph busy in his work, and Mary in her needlework and homemaking. She made the swaddling clothes for the Christ child, and 
did many other preparations for his coming. One day, Joseph is out about Nazareth doing errands, and the edict of Caesar is proclaimed on the street corners. He returns home, sorrowful of what this will entail for the Holy Family. Mary knows why he's worried, and they discuss what they should do. And Joseph is beside himself. He knows that he can go to his place of you know, of his family and, and register. But that leaves Mary now nine months with child. And something can happen while he's gone. And he also knows if she goes, it's going to be treacherous. So Joseph's idea is, let's just skip it. He says, we can kind of make like we leave town and we can come back. No one will ever know. And he wants that to be the answer, but he knows in his heart, it's not going to be that way. And so he asks the Blessed Mother to pray to the Most High. Because by now Joseph knows that she's got a better connection than he does anyway. So he asks the Blessed Mother. And she returns and says to him that it's the will of the Father that we go to Bethlehem. So having delayed their decision for only a short time, they make arrangements to go. And Joseph sets out about the village of Nazareth to find a beast of burden. And here's another really cool part of the story. Even with just that little delay, the town gets busy. And all of the beasts of burden are already gone, rented, or taken. And poor Joseph, he looks throughout the entire village and he gets to the outskirts of town and he finds this tiny little donkey. It's all that's left. And in my own mind, I think, well, it must be a younger one because it's smaller. But what an incredible story of the last shall be first. Here's this tiny little donkey that no one else wanted. And he now gets to carry the creator of the universe and serve the Holy Family, not only on their trip to Bethlehem, but all the way to Egypt. What an incredible story. They leave the next day, and it's midwinter, and the trip is hard. It's cold and snowy. There's rain sometimes, and ice pallets. 10,000 angels accompany them on the way. But it's hard for the Holy Couple. Joseph and the Holy Angels do what they can to shield the Blessed Mother. But they're not treated well on their way in the inns that they stay in. They're left in hallways or lean to extensions. And once they had to get into an animal shelter just to get out of the weather. The trip takes five days instead of four because Joseph cuts each day short for the care of Mary and the child. They arrive in Bethlehem at 4 p.m. on the fifth day and they begin to canvas the village for shelter. And all the relatives and places that Joseph thought that he could easily find shelter never came to be. And they go street by street, knocking on almost every door, not finding shelter. But they do find the Roman curator, and they complete their lawful census account. After many hours, they've exhausted all chances and Joseph has knocked on 50 doors and he falls defeated before our blessed mother. I have failed you. What can we do? He said, I did see a small shepherd shelter on the way to town. We could try there. And Mary says, yes, let us go there. Now this is a common shelter for all of the shepherds. It's used in case of foul weather and they would run
run their flock in. Being common to all, it wasn't really taken care of by any. You can imagine the foulness of this place. Bethlehem is full to the brim. If it would have been able to have been used by someone, it would have already been taken. It was unfit for human use. Can you imagine the depth of the sheep dung? When they arrive at 9 p.m., they are exhausted. But the night is cold, and they give thanks to the Father for bringing them to this place. The Blessed Mother and St. Joseph begin immediately to clean the cave. Joseph and the angels, who now become visible to both of them, begin to do the hard work, and Mary cleans with them. By 11 p.m., the cave is clean, and they have a fire going, and they're sharing a small meal together. They are both very tired. The day has left them depleted. And they each encourage each other to get much needed rest. Joseph prepares a small bed on a rock shelf for Mary. And some clothing is taken to the sheep manger for the child that they know is near. Mary reclines and Joseph goes to the entrance of the cave and does the same. They both go into ecstasy and prayer by the will of the Father. And it says in there that Joseph's sleep is like that of Adam in the Garden of Eden. So you know he's in deep sleep. An hour passes and the hour is about midnight. And the Almighty tells the Blessed Mother that it is time. And she is brought forth from her state in a kneeling position, prostrate before God, to give birth to our Lord. He comes forth as light through a prison and is received into the world, into the arms of the great archangels Michael and Gabriel. And they hold him for our queen to see and to talk to. With the reverence as if holding the Holy Eucharist. The Blessed Mother, still kneeling, converses with the Most Holy Child about many things that are to come and the mysteries that he wishes to reveal to her. He asks her things like, how am I, a humble being, to care for you, the creator of the universe? And the Lord reassures her in so many ways. He is then taken in his human form from the holy archangels and held in her own arms. At the moment of his coming, all of heaven emptied out and they were all present at the cave in Bethlehem. Can you imagine heaven emptying out and being present at the cave? The earth changed. The stars aligned. They were brighter. All of creation knew that the Creator was present. But man did not. Even Lucifer knew that things had changed in the universe. But he was not privy to the reason why. Mary, now holding the Christ in her arms, looked upon the thousands and thousands of human form angels before her, and they rejoiced at his coming. Mary now wished to call her holy spouse Joseph from his ecstasy of perfect rest where he had been made known of all that had taken place by our Heavenly Father. Coming into the cave and 
seeing the Holy Mother and the Christ child in her arms. Great joy and admiration filled his heart. Tears filled his eyes, and he adored in great humility. He kissed the feet of the child so tenderly, and Mary wrapped the child in the swaddling clothes and placed him in the manger. An ox ran up from a neighboring field and entered the cave. Joining the small donkey, they bowed down in adoration of the Creator. At the command of the Queen, they warmed him with their breath and paid him service that men had refused. After the angels of heaven had thus celebrated the birth of God, some of them were dispatched to different places to announce the happy news. The archangel Michael was going to the patriarchs in limbo and announced that the only begotten had been born and was already resting between two beasts as they had prophesied of old. He gave a special message to Joachim and Anne of congratulations that their daughter now held in her arms the promised one of ages. And they sent back a request asking that their daughter pray for them before the highest Lord God. Another angel was sent to Elizabeth and her son John. They protracted themselves and adored God made man in their age. And Elizabeth immediately sent food, money, linens, and whatever she thought the Holy Family may need by a messenger, servant. If God had not given her the resolve, she would not have been able to keep herself from going. To praise the newborn King of the world in person. Other angels were sent to inform Zachary and Simeon and the priestess Anna and other prominent faithful alive at this time. Among these were the three Magi kings of three separate kingdoms. The angel also set the star in place that they were to follow the course. And hence, the archangel Gabriel was dispatched to announce this great news to the poor shepherds of the fields. He appeared to them in human form in great splendor. It was the Father's will that the shepherds be the first to know among the men of the earth. They were the most open to hear of the Messiah and they had talked about it around their campfires for generations. And the archangel Gabriel came to them in the fourth watch of the night. They departed without delay to the cave that they all knew well. And upon entering, they found it just as the angel has told them. Mary, Joseph, and the child lay in the manger. They did him homage in a most reverent way. And they remained in the cave from the beginning of dawn to midday the next day. Having given them something to eat, our Queen sent them off, full of heavenly grace and consolation. During the days that the Holy Family stayed there, the Holy Shepherds returned a few times and brought such gifts as their poverty could provide. These shepherds were saints, filled with divine knowledge until they died. And when Herod sacrificed the children of the holy innocents, some were the children of these holy men. A side note, the first time that Joseph held the baby Jesus. And from that time on, when they passed the Christ, 
to one another, Mary and Joseph did so on their knees in reverence, like passing the Holy Eucharist. The time had passed and arrived for the circumcision to be performed. A rite of passage for the Jewish people. It was the will of the Father that he endured this ritual of men. Mary asked Joseph to make the arrangements. And in the meantime, Mary prepared the linen cloth to catch the sacred blood for the first time that would be shed for our rescue, so that not a drop would fall to the ground. Joseph went to Bethlehem to ask the priest to come and perform the rite. Mary had also requested that he buy a crystal flask from the dealers with the money that Elizabeth had sent. The priest arrived with two other men, and upon seeing the humble cave, he was taken back by the sheer poverty of the place. But once inside, he was assured by the presence of the mother and child, so beautiful to behold. The Blessed Mother requested that she hold the child during this process instead of the men. The ritual at that time was that the priest and the acolytes that were with him would perform the rite, and many times the family would be absent, go outside and do that. And here is where our Blessed Mother's humility comes forth. She doesn't want to interfere with the authority of the priests, but she has a longing for the Creator that is beyond what you and I can know. And so she, when she's asked to leave the cave, she gently asks to not only be present, but to hold the child during this. And the priest allows her that gift, that request. The Blessed Mother holds the child, and both mother and child wept in unison on the painful act. She took the linen from under her bosom, where it had been warmed, and caught the holy blood of the relics. Both Jesus and Mary proclaimed the name of Jesus for the priest, for the record. After the priest had left, the relics were placed in the crystal flask and sealed by the Blessed Mother as if sired, never to be opened again. And for the rest of their time on earth, this never left their possession. And this really intrigued me when I read this. And our Blessed Mother was given power over many things of the earth and the heavens. And when she sealed this flask, it said that it was grammatically sealed as though the shopkeeper had done it with sire. And when Joseph would leave the holy house to do his work, the rabbi would go with him close to his heart. And when he was back and our mother would go somewhere, it would be with her. So they were never without the presence of the Creator um, with them. And after Joseph's passing, our Blessed Mother kept that on her person until she was assumed into heaven many, many years later, at which time she left it to the apostles as a relic of the church. And I read this and I'm like, it's out there somewhere. You know, it's an incredible gift um, to know these things. So by, the time, by this time, the town of Bethlehem was again free of travelers. And Joseph suggested that they go into town and obtain better lodging. And then the archangels, Michael and Gabriel, appeared in human form to Joseph and Mary. 
saying that divine providence has ordained that you remain in this very place until the kings of Orient should adore the divine word in this place. They were already ten days into their journey. They had each received the message in a dream from the angel, and they arose in haste and left their own lands to find the child king. Heading in the same direction, they eventually met up with one another. And the rest of the journey, they traveled together following the star. They followed the star all the way to Jerusalem, where they entered the city seeking answers of the king. Having found no answers from Herod, they left the city and went again outside the city. They saw the star appear and led them to Bethlehem and to the cave outside the walls. Joseph was at the side of Mary when the Magi approached to adore the Christ child. She asked him to stand over here. These were men of great reverence, and she wanted Joseph by her side. They expressed wonder and compassion at the great poverty of it all. This great exchange of adoration and conversation consumed more than three hours, and the time of the day was late. The three kings asked to take leave and to go into the city for lodging, which they did. And all through the night, they talked and they could not sleep. Each described how he was taken by the presence of the mother and the child and how they were changed by this great experience. On the following day, at dawn, they returned to the cave bearing gifts that they had brought, offering gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They wanted to give much more. However, the Blessed Mother would not accept anything more. At one point, they even offered to build a home for them. But our Blessed Mother, in her humility, which had wrapped the Christ child. With the blessings of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they departed in great sorrow, leaving part of their hearts behind. This encounter had changed their lives forever. They returned home by another route, as they were told by the angel in a dream. In their own countries, they performed many miracles with the relics and told of their great encounter always. They were great disciples of the Lord and they proclaimed the faith of the Lord all of their lives. And I'm just amazed that many times through this entire history, the people that our Blessed Mother touches through the power of our Lord their lives change, and they never go back. And I think, what an incredible gift to have that, you know, from our Blessed Mother. After the Magi had left, the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph decided to divide up the gifts and give them away. They split them into thirds, some to go to the priest, did the circumcision, some for the temple in Jerusalem when they were to go for the presentation, and the rest to the poor. At that time, a woman that lived in a small dwelling, propped up on the outside of the city wall, stopped by. 
She had come many times to see if the Holy Family needed anything. She was also given a gift for her great help to the family. And in her reply and gratitude, she offered her humble dwelling for them to stay in. Joseph and Mary decided to go there until their time of the presentation. The cave was becoming a place of attraction. Many had heard of the Magi kings coming, and people were coming by to see the place. Upon leaving, the Blessed Mother gave honor to this place where the Creator had been born man. And when the Holy Family left, God the Father placed an angel there to guard and protect this holy place always. And never again did animals use this place. And when I was reading in, in other parts of there, Mary of Agreda asked the Blessed Mother, well, what about the places in the Holy Land today? And the Blessed Mother said, those are the true places. And they are guarded by the angels. And I just thought that was so powerful to hear that. And many have been there and, and know that when you go to those places, you feel you know, the holiness that they are. The time of the presentation had come. And St. Joseph and the Blessed Mother made plans to be in Jerusalem on the day prescribed by the law, meaning that there were so many days that they were to wait, and they wanted to be there on the last day of the prescribed law. So taking leave of the woman who had been so kind to them, they departed. And on their way, they stopped by the cave of the Nativity, and once again venerated the sanctuary so humble yet so rich in happiness. They withdrew, and the angel recovered his charge over the holy place. The winter weather was cold, and as they set out, the Blessed Mother cuddled the Christ child to her breast tightly to keep him warm. An angel had made it known to Simeon and Anna that the Holy Family were on their way. Simeon dispatched a temple guard to go to the gate of the city facing Bethlehem and to watch for them. He did so, and upon their arrival, took them to his home and gave them shelter as he was told. That evening, Joseph went out to the temple and gave the gifts anonymously to a temple guard. He also purchased the two doves for the offering the next day. And so that was interesting too because they had enough money to buy a lamb, which is what the wealthy did at presentation. But Mary and Joseph talked and Mary said, no, we need to do what is our livelihood, our giving. And so the gift was given anonymously, and the two doves were purchased in their poverty. The next day, they arrived at the temple gate, and the Blessed Mother knelt down with the other women there. Her heart was filled with joy as she held the Christ child in her arms. In that moment, she was taken up in a vision by the Holy Trinity, and God the Father said to her, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Where have you heard that before? Moved by the Holy Spirit, Simeon entered the area and approached the mother and child. And Anna, the priestess, also entered about the same time, and was drawn to the mother and child by the angelic glow that surrounded them. 
Simeon took the child in his hands and raised him up to the heavens and proclaimed, Now, O oh God, you may take your servant, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. He recited a canticle that lasted several minutes of the prophecies of old. Joseph and Mary were amazed at its content, because they knew the books very well. And then Simeon addressed the Holy Mother, Behold, this child is set for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be contradicted, and thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Then he gave his blessing to the Holy Couple. In the moment of the High Priest's blessing, the Blessed Mother foresaw all that was to take place of the fall of the old and the building up of the new church and the great suffering that her and her son would endure and the ultimate gift of his life on the cross for the redemption of mankind. And I was sharing before we started this evening the seven sorrows and the prophecy of Simeon starts that all in place. Saint Joseph also saw great suffering ahead, although not to the extent that the Blessed Mother did because he was not to be an eyewitness of it. Simeon and Anna both died shortly after their encounter with the Christ in the temple. And this concludes the story of the activity of our Lord Jesus Christ as seen by the Venerable Mary of Grady in visions. And I know that we've going in just about an hour, and I just wanted to say a few things about how this happened in, in my own life. Most of my life, 